Right now we're in the Dominican Republic, but pretty soon we're going to be heading down through Suriname and Guyana and into Brazil and the Amazonia region. Our plan is to go explore the jungles around there, see the Amazon, fly in as deep as we can because not many people do that, and really get to look at all the different flora and fauna and as well as just see the environmental impact that the entire world has on it. We really want to go and see the unknowns of the world or the unseen so many people get to experience and learn from it. I'm Peter McCulley. The Porters, a BC family of five, took off on a flight around the world in a single engine plane in June. We'll catch up with them and find out where they are and how it's been going so far when Today in BC continues. From the latest community news to informative, entertaining reads for travelers and the cannabis curious, just visit your local Black Press Media community newspaper website to sign up today. We're chatting with Ian Porter and his daughter Sydney from Vancouver, who along with the rest of the family are flying around the world in a single-engine plane. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, nice to be with you, Peter. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much for having us. So first off, where are you at this very moment? Right now, we've just been a couple of days here in the Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic. Well, that sounds pretty nice. It's a beautiful time of year, although it's middle of summer, so it's very hot and, and humid, but no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, review the seating arrangement on the plane to refresh everyone's memory. Who is making the trip and who is a licensed pilot? Absolutely. So basically, we're flying a Gypsero GA8 Airban, which is an eight-seat airplane, Although we've taken three of them, that's obviously for the, the whole family of five. It's myself, my wife, Michelle, and the three kids, Samantha, 21, Sydney, 18, and Christopher, 15. And of that whole crew, I'm the pilot, and uh, Sydney and Samantha are both private pilots as well. First part of the expedition from Vancouver all the way out to Newfoundland, three of the five were on that part of the expedition. Sydney had to stay in Vancouver with her mom to basically finish her high school and get her high school uh, diploma. So we have to get off to the university when we get back. Have you and your sister, Samantha, been getting lots of co-piloting time? We have. <laughs> There's always someone sitting right seat, and there's definitely been a few squabbles, I'd call them, about who gets to sit right seat for which legs. And to be completely honest, I have not sat down and added up any of the hours I have flown yet, so that'll be a bit of a task coming up. I don't think I'm alone. I think it's a fairly common thing for pilots to procrastinate adding up their hours. <laughs> but it's going to be a task, and we're... So extremely grateful, Samantha and I and everyone else on the expedition, that we get to experience this not only as pilots, but just to grow as human beings through this amazing adventure. And I'm learning so much as a pilot. I learn more and more every day about doing it, building hours. And I say it's a really unique experience flying this way. So can you take us through where you've been so far in your flight? I know that you started in June from Vancouver and you've flown about 11,000 kilometers so far. Where did you head out to from Vancouver? Actually, I just want to, we're 11,000 nautical miles, so quite a bit more than 11,000 kilometers. We left Vancouver, and we basically headed north. So the first part of the trip, we went directly north up to the Arctic, across the Arctic to the Taktayaktuk and the Nuvik, and enjoyed flying around under the midnight sun. We did a couple of flights where we basically flew before midnight and then landed the next day. And visual flight rules under beautiful sunny skies. So it's a pretty cool air to be in uh, in the summertime and be able to fly basically all night. And then we headed off uh, and kept going east and south and went over to uh, the west side of Hudson's Bay. One of the goals we had was to go to Thompson, Manitoba, and hopefully see some polar bears. This time of year, it's a little early for polar bear sightings on the ground, and the, the pack ice on Hudson Bay still hadn't broken up at that time, but we were still hopeful. What we realized on um, as we were heading out there is, and one thing we didn't actually know was that the territory of Nunavut actually extends to the west side of Hudson's Bay as well. And that became relevant in that we'd already been to the Yukon and the Northwest Territories at that point. And we figured out that, boy, if we could go to Nunavut, we might be able to visit every territory and every province in Canada in the one flight across the country, which would be pretty cool. So we kind of hatched a plan to fly not only to Thompson and look for polar bears, but to fly north up the west coast of Hudson's Bay and look for polar bears and also to visit Nunavut. One of the issues doing that is 
availability of aviation fuel. And Churchill, Manitoba, where you go pull a view and doesn't have any fuel, and Arviat in Nunavut, where we're heading, does have fuel, but you have to buy it in a drum. So we had a big logistical experience about how to actually buy aviation fuel in a drum and transfer it to the plane. So uh, it was an interesting time. We ended up going to the local home hardware store and buying a, a fuel pump actually from out of an automobile and a whole whole pile of plastic pipe in and a bunch of different parts. And we basically jumped in the plane and flew up to Nunavut and bought ourselves a 40-gallon or 200-liter drum of aviation fuel to transfer into the plane to be able to get out of there. An interesting side note on that, we were fully expecting the price of the fuel up in somewhere as remote as Nunavut up on the northwest coast of uh, Hudson's Bay to be you know, to be even more expensive. So we were shocked when we spoke to the person at the airport selling the fuel that a 200-liter drum of aviation fuel was $350, basically $1.50 a liter. I had to confirm with them three or four times on the telephone to make sure I wasn't getting a bad connection or misunderstanding, but no, indeed, it was basically $350 for a 200 liter of gas. And so we were pretty happy about that, to say the least. Then we went up there and we filled up. And the reason we found out was, I guess, a couple of things. First of all, their fuel is delivered once per year by barges that are brought in late in the summertime when all the pack ice is off Hudson's Bay. And so this aviation fuel had been at least a year earlier at a different price than today's price. The other thing which we didn't realize at the time either is that in Nunavut, the all for outboard motors and for cars and for aviation fuel is, is quite heavily subsidized by the government. So it turned out to be one of the most remote places we, we put fuel in the airplane in Canada ended up being the cheapest fuel we paid for <laughs> on wow. the trip. Where did you head to from Nunavut? For Nunavut, we kept going across across Canada, across Ontario, Quebec, and over to the Maritimes and to Newfoundland, where we picked up the balance of the crew and kind of filled all five seats of the airplane. Then we started our journey back westward and uh, across Quebec and southern Ontario, stopping in lots of places and meeting lots of people and having a great time. Our next sort of focus was to get to Oshkosh in Wisconsin, where there's a kind of like the largest aviation exposition on earth it basically happens there every summertime we manned a booth there at the oshkosh uh, expo for a week along with the charity that we're working uh, you know to try and raise money for sos children's villages and that was a great experience it's huge expedition exposition about six hundred fifty thousand people go to it during the week and tens of thousands of airplanes fly in there. So it's a real experience just basically flying into this airport at Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where literally they get special permission from the Federal Aviation Administration, which is in the U.S., to land multiple airplanes at one time on a single runway. So you can be approaching with uh, two or three airplanes all at the same time, landing on the same runway at different spots on the runway. And with literally hundreds of airplanes in the air at any one time. So it's a really, it's a really cool experience. <laughs> Sydney, I've been on your Facebook page and the website, and there's videos of the interior of the plane, the cabin, landings. Who's the tech whiz and gets all the photos and videos posted? The, the group effort. <laughs> I build and manage all of the website content while my sister Samantha, she manages Everything that we put up on all of our social media, like our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all of that. Um, all we are manage it is definitely a group effort because we have so many photos and videos from everywhere that we've been and quite a large task to handle. It's not a fun chore managing all the videos and downloading them all, but getting them up, we all, we all work together. I've noticed that there's been quite a few photos and videos already and you're only a couple of months into this 14-month trip. You're getting your share of wonderful spots to stop in. What's your, your favorite so far? Oh, that's not a fair question. <laughs> Probably not. My favorite places we've been to are the ones we don't plan on going. Like one of my favorite days, I'm going to call it an experience, is when we were flying through the Bahamas. We had no intention of doing this, but we left Nassau in the morning and we started flying out trying to make it out to another island so we could actually leave the Bahamas. But as weather goes, it never cooperates. The clouds started going really low and we started getting 30 knot headwinds. When you're flying over the open ocean, that is not really a good thing. Not very fun, not very safe. 
then it's diverting into one of the least visited islands in the Bahamas called Mayaguana. It has about 200 full-time residents on it and almost no tourists. And we'd never heard of it before. We saw it had an airport end up landing and it was, I don't want to say deserted, but it was rather abandoned. Everything was breaking down. We ended up tying the plane down. There was a car rental sign, actually. So you called the number on the car rental sign and two guys on a truck who was carrying barrels of diesel came out to pick us up and we sat in the back of the truck and they drove us into the island's hotel and we stayed there for the night, which is amazing because I thought we were going to be sleeping on the floor outside or in the terminal with the roof caving in. So nights like those are definitely a bit nerve wracking because you don't know what's going on. But those are the experiences that I enjoy the most. I think the rest of my family does as well. Because it's constant, you never know what's going to happen next. And it's it's extremely unique. You mentioned that uh, part of the crew flew to St. John's and you met them there. Were there any COVID restrictions or problems with the flights along the way? On the COVID front, we're all fully vaccinated and certainly have all of our documentation up to date. And frankly, we haven't really had any issue anywhere. We're currently, as I mentioned, in the Dominican Republic. We flew down through the States and through the Bahamas uh, to get here, and we're moving on south from here. And and literally, we have had no issues whatsoever at any place as far as, as COVID restrictions. We have our paperwork. Frankly, the vast majority of places we've been to haven't even been interested in seeing our paperwork. And we've been carrying masks, et cetera, and all the other paraphernalia that goes along with. And again, most of the places, that hasn't been a requirement. In reality, it hasn't been a huge, huge issue. When Today in BC continues, we'll find out where in the world the porters are heading. Why spend hours searching dealerships, comparing makes and models? Find the best of BC's inventory in one place, todaysdrive.com. You'll have access to inventory across BC, where you can easily find a vehicle that fits your needs and gets you where you need to go in comfort. Get in the driver's seat. Don't miss out on the many options we have available for you. Powered by Black Press Media, todaysdrive.com connects you with exclusive new and used car deals. I'm Peter McCulley. Today in BC is a Black Press Media podcast. Has weather been an issue anywhere along at this point? Any places you were grounded for a few days because of thunder and lightning or whatever? Weather by far is the biggest variable in this whole expedition. And we've done about 11,000 nautical miles so far and over basically pretty well every kind of terrain almost already that you could imagine from, you know, coastal mountains of British, British Columbia up to the high Arctic and then across to the East Coast and now down into the tropics. Weather's, you know, a, a constant concern and a constant part of all of our backing up. It's one reason we're, we wanted to take 14 months to do this expedition so we could allow for, you know, not having to fly if the weather was bad. And so far, we've seen a little bit of everything. We haven't had any long delays, but we've certainly had multiple delays of not being able to fly for a particular day because of too strong winds or rainstorms. It's changed as we go through. Now we're down in the Caribbean, and it's a very different set of weather criteria down here. What's happening right now as we speak, I mean, there's Saharan sand and dust coming for, through storms across the North Atlantic. That's having an effect on the weather. Every day it's about thunderstorms. I mean, the typical cycle here in a day, which we don't really see, particularly in Vancouver, is very hot and humid. So every single day starts off sunny, and then in the afternoon the thunderstorms build, and there's you know, quite often you know, heavy rain late in the afternoon. So on the bigger picture... We're right in the middle of hurricane season, so we're keeping a very wary eye on the NOAA you know, hurricane forecast. And thankfully so far this season, while it's predicted to be a very big hurricane season or a very busy hurricane season, so far it actually hasn't. And there has been no major tropical cyclone that's been close to developing into a hurricane, which we're kind of thankful about that. I've been following your trip via your website. Has there been anything unexpected happened that might have thrown a rather large monkey wrench into your plan so far, other than having to figure out how to get the fuel into the plane from the uh, from the fuel drum? I don't think we've actually had one big monkey wrench thrown into the plans, but I would say that we've had 
dozens and dozens of small monkey wrenches. So, uh, and that's kind of par for what we're doing. So, I mean, on the very first day we left Vancouver, I mean, a few hours into the expedition, we got a flat tire on the runway in Terrace, British Columbia, and basically shut the airport down and shut the runway down and had to have a whole bunch of planes divert around and land on a different runway because we were sitting in the middle of a runway with a flat tire. Not the end of the world. That's a monkey wrench. And then again, every sort of day has the potential of a monkey wrench and some you dodge and some you don't. We're flying through airspace we don't know that well or know at all in weather conditions that are different from the norm from what we're used to. And a lot of the air traffic communication, while some of it's available in English, a lot of the traffic communication over the radio and with air traffic control, et cetera, is not necessarily in English. There's all these challenges that kind of build upon themselves. Have you been in contact with folks who are following your progress through social media and your website? We have. It's the coolest thing that I didn't think ever, for example, we we're camping there. People who come by and they go, I know that plane. I've seen you. I've seen you on TikTok or I've seen you on Instagram or I saw this thing on the news and I looked at your website. And it's, it's incredibly amazing. And it just shows the power of social media and everything on the internet um, because then all of a sudden you have these connections with these people who you otherwise would have no connection with. It's truly incredible. In the next month or so, where are you heading to? Right now we're in the Dominican Republic, but pretty soon we're going to be heading down through Suriname and Guyana and into Brazil and the Amazonia region. Our plan is to go explore the jungles around there, see the Amazon, fly in as deep as we can, because not many people do that, and really get to look at all the different flora and fauna, and as well as just see the environmental impact that the entire world has on it. We really want to go and see the unknowns of the world or the unseen that many people get to experience and learn from it. So that's where we're off to next. So the charity that you're hoping to raise awareness and money for is the SOS Children's Villages Canada. Can you tell me how the fundraising is going so far on your trip? The fundraising is going pretty well. We're looking to do two things with SOS. Firstly, it's to increase awareness, first of all, of SOS with people. It's a great charity, great organization. They've been around since, I believe, it's 1943. They operate in over 130 countries around the world, including Canada and the United States and basically provide a love and care and family home for children at risk and orphans. Right now, the fundraising is going okay. Our plan around the fundraising is we're looking to build a big social media following from what we're doing and hopefully in the future monetize it through to donations for SOS Children's Villages. Remind us how we can follow you on the internet and social media. Follow us along on our website at www.5inthesky.com. We also have our Instagram and our TikTok and Facebook at Fly 5 in the Sky, all with the number five. We have a lot more crazy, exciting, and interesting content coming soon, which we're in the process of creating right now. I'd like to thank Ian and Sydney Porter for joining us on this edition of Today in BC. If you have suggestions or comments, send us a voice message to podcast at blackpress.ca. You may be part of our podcast mailbag segment. You'll find Today in BC podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, and Google Podcasts.